One of the greatest challenges to our faith is when we go through sufferings. I mean, why do I suffer? That's the question. Especially when it's unjust or it's unfair. It can really challenge the very core of our faith. If Father God loves me, why do I need to suffer like this? If God is all powerful and He can heal the sick, He can deliver the oppressed, He can provide for the needy, then why do I need to suffer in my situation I'm in? Now, of course we know that some sufferings are self-inflicted. You make mistakes, you were foolish, you listened to wrong advices, you trusted the wrong people, you sinned against the Lord, you sinned against your own body. Well, there are consequences. Pastor Iris mentioned today, whatever you sow, you're gonna reap. So there will be heartbreaks. The marriage may fail, your career may be affected, your health may break down. So some sufferings are self-inflicted, but some sufferings are also thrust upon us by others. You are in the wrong place at the wrong time, mixing with the wrong crowd. There is bullying, abuses, oppression, injustice, unfairness. Now, this is not easy. You have not really done anything wrong, but you are suffering because of other people. Sometimes it's a combination of the two. You are in pain because of yourself and because of others. And then there is suffering caused by sicknesses, natural disasters, and so on. Sufferings affects all of us in our souls, in our emotions, in our physical body. And it pierces us on different levels. Sometimes we can heal without any scars. Other times, it cuts us up so deeply. The wounds and the scars, they remain for years and for years, and they may not even go away. Yet, if you're honest, your most urgent reach for God usually happens in the midst of sufferings. When we are in pain, we search for God. We seek the Lord. We reach out to Him. Our faith seeks understanding. We want to know why. Why am I suffering? Why is this happening to me? If love is the greatest, how can we keep on loving God and loving life as it is in the midst of all the pain? Now, let us be clear. Evil is evil. Evil is evil. The fact that God overcomes evil with good, it doesn't mean we should romanticize evil. There's nothing good about evil. There's nothing moral or beautiful about it. Evil is bad. Evil defiles. For example, for Jesus, the cross was not a good thing. It was evil. The cross was an instrument of torture, of unjust murder. So when you read the Bible, Acts 2.23 says that wicked men used the cross to nail Jesus Christ to death. But God turned this around and made the cross the means of salvation. Come on, let's give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. Amen. What is meant for evil, God turned it around for our good. But what the wicked did to Jesus was still an evil thing. So we all live in a fallen world. The Bible says in this present evil age where Satan is the God of this world, always seeking to hurt us, to trap us, to oppress us, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Remember I told you in the last few sermons, the moment God decided to create, He knew that He knew already His creation will bring a lot of pain and heartache to themselves and to Him. He knew because 
in order for you and I to be truly human, to be a real person, God must necessarily give us free will. Otherwise, we will all be robots. Turn to your neighbors and say, you're not a robot. <laughs> yeah. We must be able to freely choose to love God or to reject Him. Otherwise, our love for God is not real. If God forces us to love Him, it's not real love. Our love for one another has to be real. But God knew that giving us free will will result in evil and darkness on the world. Because free will means it is possible for you and I to sin. And we all do this all the time. We do sin and keep on sinning. And there will be great sufferings for us and for God. So why then did God still create? Because He counted the cost. Yes, all will suffer. But God will personally join us in our sufferings to be our Redeemer. He will use all our sufferings and the frustrations we face in this fallen world to change us, to transform us to be like Jesus, to bring us deeper and deeper into His loving embrace. Now, look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. In Genesis 1 and verse 26, God says, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness. Do you see the goal over here? Two things. What is the goal in creation? The image of God and the likeness of God. But when he actually did it, look at the next verse. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Notice, God only did one of the two. We are all created in the image of God, but we are not totally like him yet. In a full-grown, mature, perfect state. Yes, all the raw materials are within us, but we still need to grow yes. and to conform into the likeness of Christ. Amen. That is the goal. Yes. That is the plan. Yes. Oh, go ahead and praise the Lord. Hallelujah, amen. Oh, you want to clap? Let's give the Lord a big clap. Hallelujah. That's the goal. To be so full of love and joy and truth and purity, so full of the life and the power of the Holy Spirit, like Jesus. Turn to your neighbors on your left and right and say, your goal is to become more like Jesus. Yeah. What is your goal to become more like? Jesus. But to become that loving, perfected person, it means that God will allow you to go through the risky adventure of free will. It's risky. You will make bad choices. You will freely make choices in your life. Some will be good. Many others will be bad. You will be affected by the free choices, the free will of others around you and suffer the evil that results from it. But God promises this. He will join us in our sufferings every step of the way to help us reach that goal, to grow in Christ's likeness, becoming more and more like Jesus. So that is the plan. In the midst of all your pain and all your frustrations, as you reach out to God, 
you will learn to lose your pride. You will lose your self-centeredness, your selfishness. We will all learn to trust Him and love Him more. And by the Spirit, we will become more humble, more patient, kinder, gentler, purer. We will become holier. In the end, we will come into a very deep and loving communion with God, enjoying Him forever, living in eternal delight. That's the plan. And it will make the whole path of suffering worthwhile, totally. Just consider the story of Job. Very few people in history suffered like Job. And do you know, until the day he died, he never knew the reason why he had to suffer. (laughs) Job's life was a testimony of the victory of faith and the victory of love. And for those of you that's going through a challenging time tonight, the story of Job is gonna be a huge encouragement for you. In the beginning of the story, God highlighted Job's faithfulness to the devil. Now, Satan is really terrible. He was so cynical. So he said to God, oh, please, Job is only faithful to you because you are protecting him from harm. You are taking care of all his needs. Listen to the devil. Listen to Satan, all right? He says, In Job chapter one and verse 10, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. Now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. God, just open your eyes. Job's life is so smooth sailing. Why wouldn't he be faithful? He knows that it is in his best interest to obey you. So Satan was implying that God was deluded in thinking that Job's faith was real. God, you're being used. His faith is a joke. Look, his love for you is not real. Everyone is only interested in what he can get out of you. So God allowed Satan to remove the protective hedge, to expose Job and his family to the full brunt of life with all its sufferings. Satan struck a blow to every area of Job's happiness. In one day, all his sheep and his cattle, all his wealth and all his servants were ravaged by intruders in one day. Then that night, a tornado struck his home while his children were having dinner, causing the roof to collapse and crash on all of them. All seven sons and three daughters died instantly. All 10 of them died in one night. Job lost his business, he lost his wealth, he lost his property, most of all, he lost his kids. Can you imagine the unbelievable pain, the sorrow and the anguish within him? But in spite of all that, Chapter one ends with Job choosing to continue to love and to trust God. Look at verse 20, chapter one and verse 20. Job fell to the ground in worship and said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away May the name of the Lord be praised. And in all this, Job did not sin 
by charging God with wrongdoing. At this point, Satan's argument was losing credibility, right? His back was against the wall. He had only one card left to play. He said, God, don't think Job is so loyal to you. He is just as self-centered as everyone else. All he really cares is his own life. So look at chapter two and look at verse four. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and struck his flesh and bones. And he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. <laughs> you see that? The devil struck Job with a dreadful disease. Do you know? There's even a name for that disease today. It's called Job's syndrome. <laughs> Your immunity breaks down. You have skin and lungs infection. You have pneumonia and there's no cure for it. <laughs> Others say what Job got was leprosy, which was the most dreadful disease in ancient times, whatever it was. Job remained faithful and loyal to God. He surrendered himself to the Lord and kept loving Him. Look at verse 10. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Job said, in all this, Job did not sin in what he said. At this point, <laughs> Satan had already run out of argument. Job's story proves it is possible to have real faith, to genuinely trust and love the Lord for who He is and not only for His blessings. Job shows us what true faith and true love looks like under fire. Now, what is amazing is that Job never knew why he had to go through all the sufferings. He never knew. He didn't know what was happening behind the scenes. That Satan the devil was the instigator and the cause of all his pain. He had no clue whatsoever. Of course, today, we have the Bible. We can read the stories, and we say, oh, we are privy to the entire backstory. But not for Job. One moment, everything was fine. And the next moment, poof, everything was gone. Why like that? Now, after Satan exited from the drama, Job's friends entered the plot and they were almost just as bad as the devil. Turn to your neighbor and say, please don't treat me like Job's friend. Yeah. Sometimes with friends like that, we don't need the devil. They started accusing Job, condemning Job, patronizing Job. You know what that means, patronizing? They talk to him with an air of superiority, with a holier-than-thou attitude. And I'm better than you attitude. They tried to boss Job around. Job say, hey guys, I really have not done anything wrong. I don't know why all these bad things are happening to me. So Job said of God, chapter 23, Job said of God, if only I knew where to find him, if only I could go to his dwelling, I would state my case before God and fill my mouth with arguments. So you see, Job was struggling. In all his sorrows, he was wrestling with God. He wrestled with God, but never, never, ever once did he give up his faith. Not even once. Look, when you are suffering and you are in pain, it is okay 
to tell God how you really feel. God, I'm suffering. God, I'm in pain. Please help me, I don't understand. It is okay to tell God. So Job wrestled with God. He protested, he cried, he prayed, he struggled, and God was not at all upset or offended. Turn to the person on your left and right, say, it's okay to wrestle with God. Yeah. In the end, in the midst of a storm, God came to Job in the storm. Now, many scholars believe Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It was written even before the book of Genesis. Job was probably living around the same time as Abraham. But while God appeared many times to Abraham, and Abraham saw the form of God, Job did not. That is why his faith was so amazing. And now, he was in the middle of a terrible storm, as if his sufferings were not bad enough. He had lost everything, and he was still in the storm. Sometimes you feel like that. The storms of life, they just don't stop. And all he could hear was a still small voice of, of the Lord in his heart. And the Lord encouraged him. Job, there's a lot you don't know, but I have a purpose for your life that's greater than all your sufferings. You just have to trust me. So when you come to the last chapter, the last chapter, chapter 42, all right? And it says over here in verse one, then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. There's something very powerful here in verse two. God has a redemptive purpose in every hardship. God has a great purpose. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Turn to your neighbors and say, God's purpose for you cannot be stopped. Yeah, tell at least two or three people, God's purpose for you cannot be stopped, yeah? Yeah. Can God's purpose for you be stopped? Talk to me, no. Friends, God doesn't play games with your life. And he doesn't want you to be defined by your sufferings. God has a purpose when he allows you to face hardships. And this purpose cannot be stopped. And here, Job confessed. He didn't know what this purpose was. Look at verse three. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. So even after hearing God, he says, God, I'm sure it's wonderful, but I don't know what it is. But he trusted the Lord in spite of all his sorrows and anguish. And all his life, he never knew. You know, he lived to be more than 100 years old. And Job never found out what or why. But he caught a glimpse of something very great that I want to show you. He says in chapter 19 and verse 25, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end, he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. Oh, how my heart yearns within me. Just listen to what Job was saying. I don't know why my life is so painful, but I know one thing. I was made for God's glory. 
One day, I know that I know my Redeemer, my Savior, will stand over all the earth. Job never had the Bible. But he saw Jesus at his second coming. One day, my Redeemer will be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. At that time, even though I would have died by then, yet I'll be resurrected. In my new glorified body, in my flesh, my glorified flesh, I know I will see God face to face. At that time, He will wipe away every tear. He will take away every pain. There'll be no more sickness or disease. I'll be full of the life of the Holy Spirit and I will enjoy the Lord and forever and ever in His love. And I will be experiencing the heavenly delight in His loving embrace. Oh, how my heart yearns within me for that day. Look, here was a guy who lived even before the first book of the Bible was ever written, who had no super encounters like Abraham or Moses, who went through extreme pain and grief and loss and anguish and sickness in his body and never-ending storms in his life, and yet he was so convinced that God loves him, that one day he'll be changed by his glory, that he will be filled with so much joy and delight in his loving presence. No tragedy and suffering in this life, even to the most intense degree like he had experienced, can ever loudify it. This must be the kind of faith that we have in God. This must be the kind of love that you have in the Lord. In Romans chapter eight, the apostle Paul says the same thing. In Romans chapter eight and verse 18, I consider, Paul says, that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. This is a very bold statement. He's saying, no matter what life brings, all our present sufferings are nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. Oh, go ahead and give the Lord a big hand. If you want to clap, give him a big clap. Hallelujah. We are going to have a glory so great revealing out of us because everything we go through in life is to prepare us to be changed by the Lord. Sometimes when we have been wounded so deeply, when our suffering is so much, we cannot see beyond our pain and our disappointment. Tonight, the Holy Spirit wants you to see through the eyes of hope. See through the eyes of faith. See through the eyes of love. That like Job, when you don't have all the answers, you can still have this hope in Jesus Christ. That no matter what you're going through, God's purpose for you can never be stopped. God is working something glorious in you. And you're going to be changed inside out. And today and every day, Jesus is suffering there with you. Psalm 68 says this, praise be to God who daily bears my burdens. God, Jesus, daily is carrying your burdens with you. Every single day, Jesus is in the trenches of life, suffering together with you. The Bible says, and I've been telling you this for the last three years, 
that you must grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Jesus Christ for you. And to know and have that revelation, that experience of this love that surpasses all human knowledge. Ephesians 3, verse 18 and verse 19. No matter how deep your pain is, God's love goes even deeper, unfathomably deeper. In his day, no one suffered like Paul. He was sick. He was so forsaken. He was beaten. He was imprisoned. And soon, he's going to get martyred. And yet Paul says, all my present sufferings are nothing compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in me. And Paul says, nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. Neither hardship, nor sickness, nor life, nor death, nor angels or demons, neither the present or the future, nor any powers in the world will be ever able to separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Come on, go ahead and give the Lord a big clap. Hallelujah. Amen. Romans 8, verse 38 to verse 39. Turn to your neighbors and say, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Yeah. Last week, on the day when my family was supposed to celebrate New Year's reunion, my mother passed away. She was almost 96 years old. I didn't want to make this into something publicly known because you're having your Chinese New Year holiday. So we had a quiet family affair funeral. Just some friends of my mom and dad. Mom had a very hard life. She was a hairdresser who later became a baker. Together with dad, she worked very hard to make ends meet raising up five kids while looking after her own sickly mother and bedridden mother-in-law. One day, the doctors found a large tumor in her womb and they suspected it was cancer, endometrial cancer, cancer in the womb. Mom became very worried and shared openly with me. I prayed for her to be healed and miraculously, by the next checkup, the tumor had totally disappeared. The doctors themselves were shocked. Because of this miracle, my mom became very open to the gospel. I had the privilege of leading her in the sinner's prayer. And that day, tears of joy streamed down her face as she received Jesus as her Lord and her Savior. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. She was 67 years old at that time. Mom then asked me to pray with her that my dad would also receive Christ. So together, we could all worship God in church as a family. With that, we started to pray for my dad's salvation. One year later, mom had a heart attack and a massive stroke. The doctors didn't give her much of a chance to live. But again, Jesus intervened. It took almost a year for mom to walk and to move her arms again. But she did. However, the stroke made speaking practically impossible for her. It was so painful for son and I to see our mummy, who was always very chatty, slowly retreating into a world of silence. But during this time, God answered her prayers. My dad got saved, and they both started attending church. For the next 22 years, until 2017, my parents were a regular feature at our Sunday morning worship. I even know where, exactly where they sit. Every Sunday, they sit there, front row to the right of the stage. 
for 22 years. Every Sunday, mom would insist on going to the market at 8 a.m. in the morning, rain or shine, to buy breakfast for all our staff and volunteers. She would come to church with dad, and of course, dad would carry two big plastic bags, and she would happily distribute pals and sandwiches and chi chong funds to everyone she met in church. Many of you receive her, her breakfast because mom didn't want anyone to serve God with an empty stomach. She did that every Sunday for 22 years without fail. Even when she was becoming physically very frail, mom and dad never missed a Sunday service. She couldn't speak. She couldn't sing because of a stroke. But she enjoyed the presence of God quietly in her own way. She was always in church, always. Since 1995, she suffered greatly in her sickness. A once vivacious woman, so active in life, she could no longer talk or write or cook or bake or even walk or eat with her mouth. Eventually, my mom has to be fed every day through a tube. And yet, we saw her growing in her love for Jesus. And she was always so full of joy. She used to be a type A personality, very capable, very intense, sometimes quick-tempered, easily frustrated. And we saw her change to become an even more beautiful person with no anger towards anyone or anything. Constantly forgiving, with unlimited patience in all our hardships. Truth is, I know of no one with more fruit of long suffering than her. Although her body was daily wasting away, she was becoming more and more like Jesus. So loving and kind and gentle and generous. Three weeks ago, mom's health took a turn for the worse. Two days before Chinese New Year reunion, I went to her room. She had been groaning in pain. But the moment she saw me walking in, her face brightened up. She was so happy to see me. She was smiling, looking so positive. But I knew, son knew, she was suffering because our bedroom was next to her bedroom. She lived with us. We heard her groaning every day, all day long. She was in great agony because one by one, her organs were failing. By Friday morning, mom was really struggling. Shortly after our early morning prayer meeting, at about 7.15 a.m., I heard her voice for a moment. Eric was in my house, and we heard mom mumbling something. And a few minutes later, she was gone. She was promoted to glory. For the next few hours, before the undertakers came to take her away, I stole some quiet moments to sit alone with mommy next to her bed. She looked so beautiful, radiant, without pain or groanings. It was like she was in a beautiful, beautiful, deep, deep sleep, a very peaceful sleep, except that when I touched her, she was turning cold. But there was a love, a kindness, a peace that exuded on her face. She looked so happy, so satisfied, and so fulfilled. And instantly, I knew that mom is very happy in heaven, in the presence of God, probably laughing and talking and singing with joy unspeakable and full of glory. 
in her 28 years of sickness and sufferings. God did such a deep work within her. She became so in love with Jesus and so in love with my dad. The Holy Spirit totally changed her. She was full of kindness and gentleness. And every day, she was a picture of Christ-likeness to all of us at home. And this is the mystery of suffering. Like Job, we don't always have all the answers. I mean, why did God heal my mom of cancer but not prevent the heart attack and the strokes? We don't understand. Why is it that half the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 got their miracles and their deliverance and the other half didn't? In Acts chapter 12, why was James killed and Peter miraculously spared? Suffering is a mystery. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. All we can do is keep loving God and believing and trusting Him in the midst of it all. Yeah, hallelujah. No amount of evil and pain can penetrate more deeply than the love of God. Corey Ten Boon once said, no pit is so deep that God's love is not deeper still. Amen. Friends, nothing can stop the purpose of God in your life. And that purpose is more than just possession, power, and prestige. In the midst of all your pain and your hardships, God is aligning you to Christ, who has won the victory over every suffering. He's taking you into his loving embrace and changing you more and more into his likeness. That is goal from the very beginning. To be like Jesus is to learn to be victorious in every hardship, in every frustration. This is how Jesus is like. He was not afraid of the cross because he was more excited about the glory of the resurrection. Friends, all your pain and all your present sufferings cannot be compared to the great destiny God has prepared for you. Yes, we will believe by faith for healing. We will believe by faith for deliverance. Those of you that have cancer in your body, I believe every single day that you're going to be healed. We believe by faith for blessings that you will get out of debt for signs and wonders and miracles. Yes, we will pray. We will believe. We will confess. We will receive by faith. But our vision is cast even further than what we can get in this lifetime. One day soon, We'll stand before the Lord in glory and we're going to enjoy Him forever and ever. So intimate in our loving communion with God. So ready to receive all our future blessings and ministry in store for us. That is our ultimate purpose and destiny. And we are now being prepared by the Spirit for it. Tonight, how many of you want to grow in your love for God? Put up your hands. Yeah. How many of you tonight want to be changed into Jesus' likeness more and more? Put up your hands. Come, why don't we all stand out on our feet tonight? Why don't we just learn to express our love for Him? No matter what you're going through, the hardship, the pain, the suffering, tonight, why don't we just all come to the presence of Jesus? Come, let's just lift our hands. Just open our mouth and just talk in tongues right now for a moment, shall we? Suduria la carabaha deria la carabaha deria la carabaha deria Suduria la carabaha deria la suria la carabaha deria To be in the presence of the Lord And not know what time And bodies were healed 
families restored because we stay here in the presence of the Lord oh I never I never wanted to end I don't want you to go Cause my heart is burning In your presence, Lord Just begin to speak in tongues for a moment, shall we? Shuduria la karabahara. Shuduria la karabahara. Shuduria la Just love the Lord. Just love Him tonight. Shuduria la karabahara. 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 I wonder how many of you tonight you're going through a challenging time, a painful time. Maybe there are losses. Maybe there's grief. Maybe there are disappointments. Maybe you're sick in your body. Can we believe God for miracles? We should and we must. Faith is a powerful thing. Can we, can we pray? We should. Should we confess the promises of the Word of God? We must. But yet, how many of you tonight, you say, God, I will pray. I will believe. But in spite of all that I'm going through, I want to be like Job tonight. I never want to lose my love for you. If anything, I'm going to reach out to you even more. If anything, I'm going to be even more urgent in seeking after you. Lord, tonight, I'm going to surrender my life to you. I'm going to believe you for the best but my vision is cast further than what I could experience or get in this life. Lord, I want to come into your loving embrace. Lord, I want to be changed into the likeness of Jesus. I want to be more and more like Jesus, to have a victorious spirit. In the midst of all the suffering, Lord, I don't live for the blessing. I don't live for the now. 
I want to come into your loving embrace. If that's you tonight, wherever you are, just lift up your hands all over this place right now. I want you to just open your mouth and just talk to the Lord right now. Just talk to him tonight. I want more. I want more. I want more. Jesus, we want more of you. to close and every head to bow how many of you tonight you need a miracle from the Lord maybe a miracle of healing maybe a miracle of provision maybe a miracle of deliverance maybe a, a miracle of blessing how many of you tonight you say God I want to put my faith out there and believe you for a mighty miracle because my God is all-powerful God if that's you, I just want you to lift up your hands all over this place. You want God for a miracle right now. Can we just declare it? Okay, tonight by faith, let's declare, let's stand on the promises of God. Everybody say out loud with me. Say, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You are Jehovah Rapha. You are Jehovah Rapha. You are my healer. You are my healer. Oh Lord. Oh Lord. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are my provider. You are my you have made me the head and not the tail. I'm blessed in my coming in. I'm blessed in my going out. You are in front of me. Behind me. Beside me. Undergirding me. Over me. Your blessing will overwhelm me. If you believe that, just lift up your hands and talk in tongues right now. Father, we tonight we pray for mighty miracles of healing. On the cross, you took away every infirmity and bore our physical pain. That by the stripes of Jesus, we are healed. You shall supply all our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The place of agreement is a place of power. If you, feel, if you don't feel uncomfortable, why don't you just hold your neighbor's hands right now? I want you to begin to pray in the mighty name of Jesus tonight for miracles to happen in all our lives. Everybody pray in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Suduria la carabaha de la carabaha de la suduria la carabaha de la sadaria la carabaha de Lord, we are crying out for miracles. God, we are crying out for deliverance. We are crying out for restoration. We are praying, oh God, you'll come every storm. We are praying, help us to overcome the waters. Though we walk through the waters, we will not be drowned. When we are in the fire, we will not be burned. I want more. I want more. I want more. Jesus, I want more. You live up your heart and sing, I want more.
like God heard your prayers, can you give the Lord a big clap right now tonight? That's right, just give Him praise tonight, if you believe that. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Why don't we just lift our hearts, lift our heads, just thank the Lord for the victory. Thank the Lord in advance for the miracles. The healing is coming, the deliverance is coming, the blessings, the provision, they're all coming. Lord, we put our faith, we put our trust. We just live our hearts and we just believe, oh God. Hallelujah. Look at Pastor for a moment. If we just stop right here, it will be a great faith meeting. There's like a baby growing church. I want you to cast your vision further. I want you to come to that place where like Job, like Paul, like my mom, you are able to say, great Lord, I believe you for healing. I believe you for miracles. But even if not, this present suffering cannot be compared to the glory that I'm gonna see in me. Because ultimately, Lord, I don't, I cast my vision beyond what I can get in this life. Lord, I want to be changed in your likeness. I want to have more of you. I want to be coming into your divine embrace and communion. How many of you tonight, you're ready to go a little deeper and greater in the Lord? Just lift up your hands right now. Can you just begin to pray? Just open your mouth. Just begin to pray right now. Shuduria la karabahada. 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 Lord, we love you. We love you. We want more of you. Shigarabahada. Shigarabahada. Shuria la karabahada, la karabahada, la la karabahada. Shuria la karabahada, la karabahada, la karabahada. Lord, we love you. We love you. We want more of you. Hallelujah. I just really feel in my heart. Even from the very beginning of the meeting, Pastor Irene prophesied about restoration. And we heard of such a powerful message of how much Job chose to love God in the midst of his suffering, even though his mind couldn't comprehend it. And even as I was sitting there just listening to the sermon and remembering the words of prophecy, the word restoration, 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 just echoing in my spirit. And I felt that the Lord wants me to challenge every one of us. This is the beginning of the year. Just the other night, I listened to a TED talk and it talks about the happiest people in the world. Oxford University did a study since 1950-something, they followed a group of people. Even some that have passed on, but they have interviewed their children. Those happiest people are people that have meaningful relationships. And I sat there thinking, Job is a happy man yes. because he has a wonderful relationship yes. with the Lord. Yes. And that is the vision that I believe that the Lord wants us to have for 2023. Yes. If you remember the first message, the Lord reminded us that His love will save us. Yes. And I believe that today, the message for us is for us to respond to Him. Those of you that are watching online, I don't know what is stopping you to come back on site. But I pray with all my heart that you will find courage. Like Job would say, my mind could not comprehend it, but you are doing something 
so wonderful that I have not yet discovered. And Lord, I will learn to surrender to you and I will come back in union with you. And those of us that are on site, I pray, I pray that this year you will make the decision to go deeper in your relationship with God, leaving no room for doubt, wanting going deeper into your root, anchor your relationship into the Lord and say, God, come what may, I want to love you more this year, 2023. Blessing or not, I am here to love you. I am here to stay yes. in your house. I am here to stay in your house. To be like, Obeido, surrendering my life to serve you, to love you to praise you, to give my all to you, Lord. For you are doing something so wonderful that I have not discovered yet. Whatever is happening around me, I know I can say with full confidence that you are good. You are good. I will live to the day to say, to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. I will see your goodness, Lord. I will see your goodness and I will praise you. Me and my household, we will serve you. City Harvest Church, let's praise the Lord. Let's make the decision. Let's yes, rededicate Lord. our life in the beginning of 2023 and say, Lord, I give you my all, my heart, my whole being, my whole household. I give it to you, God. I give it to you, Lord Jesus, to be transformed to be you, to be more like you, to your likeness, oh God. say this prayer before we end tonight say dear Heavenly Father, dear Heavenly Father I want to come deeper in your love I want to come deeper in your love. this year this year draw me deeper draw me deeper in your loving embrace in your loving embrace come and change me come and change me. and make it more like you and make me more like you. more like Jesus more like Jesus more full of the spirit more full of the spirit more loving more love more humble more humble more gentle more gentle kinder kinder lord come and change me lord come and change me i give you my life i give you my life i will worship you i will worship you unconditionally unconditionally will you just lift up your hands just begin to praise him just begin to worship him surya la karabahare Surya la karabahade ala karabahade ala karabahade Surya la karabahade ala karabahade Just love the Lord just love the Lord Just love the Lord just love the Lord Shikarabahode ala karabahade Lord we love you we love you Lord we love you Hallelujah Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Unconditionally, unselfishly. Lord, we say as a church, as your people, 
Lord, nothing that we go through in this present life can be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us, to that love relationship that we can have with you, to the change in our lives that will shine forth the glory. So much like Jesus, so much love, so much joy. Father, we just commit tonight into your loving hands. Help us to live beyond these present blessings to cast our vision further to the ministry you have in store for us in heaven. Lord, to all the blessings we're going to get. Give us a foretaste of it here in this lifetime so that every day, no matter what we are going through, we have the strength, the joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Already we have a foretaste right now of how great your love is, how wonderful you are. And Lord, how we are changed from glory to glory. So we commit all this in Jesus' name. We say, Lord, we love you forever and we will enjoy you forever. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone say, Amen. Let's just give the Lord a big hand right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's right, give the Lord praise tonight. Hallelujah. Wow, how time flies. It's been a long service, but how many of you are glad you came tonight? Yeah, how many of you are not, how many of you are going to believe God for miracles, amen? But how many of you are not afraid of suffering? Nothing in this life can be compared to the glory that can come forth in us. Before you go, can you just go to seven other people? Brothers give brothers a hug, sister give sisters a hug, and say great glory is coming out through you. Can we just tell them that? Great glory is coming out through you. Hallelujah, hallelujah.